Hello and welcome to ScreenWorks. I'm John Uriate, curator of the digital program at the Photographers Gallery in London. Uh, together with Marco De Mutis, digital curator at Photomuseum Winter Tour in Switzerland, we launched ScreenWorks three years ago to jointly explore the changing role of the network image in the post-digital era. ScreenWorks is a fortnightly series of live stream conversations and guided tours led by artists, researchers, and experts in various fields related to digital media, such as video games, social media, and digital art. We invite and encourage our guests to explore the possibilities of the live stream formats, and therefore each event takes a different format. Uh, it can be a guided exploration of a corner of the internet, uh, participatory and interactive action, an invitation to learn about the work process of a given artist, or a performative stream of materials put together for the occasion by our guests. We have hosted more than 50 events over these years, and we invite you to explore them on our website on skinwars.com or on our YouTube and Twitch channels. Please remember that if you have uh, uh, found the Skinwars useful for your professional or personal interests, do consider subscribing to folders for seven euros or six pounds per month. You will support the program and its artists, and also you will get personalized a folder on folders.skinwars.com. Then you will receive files and extra content from the artists and researchers of ScreenWorks. Now some housekeeping information. Your microphone should be muted to avoid noise disturbances. If it is still on, please mute it now. And uh, to let you know that we are recording and we will be archiving this event. Um, and finally, to please uh, use the public chat to ask uh, any questions that you might have. And we will bring them to Rosalie or feel free also to send a private message to Marco or to me. And hello from me too. I am Marco De Mutis, digital curator at Photo Museum Winterthur. Today, we are taking a trip that begins from a seemingly innocent object that is for many of us associated with memories of a carefree time, that's kiddie rides. These are coin-operated amusement rides for young children that entertain the rider with motion, sometimes with sound and flashing lights. Yet today we'll explore this object through the eyes and the personal story of artist Rosalie Yu, who will reveal the colonial history and the perspective of labor contained within Hidi rights. From the point of view of photography and images, we are particularly excited to see how the artist navigates through her personal archive, Google Street View, augmented reality, historical data, generative adversarial networks, and even beyond the simple boundaries of categorization. You will accompany us through a visual journey that ranges from a comforted sense of nostalgia to haunted colonial aesthetics. From the ghostly traces and apparitions of mangled Pikachus to cursed images that negotiate an unstable Taiwanese identity. So stay with us as we embark on a very special ride ourselves. Rosalie Yu is a Taipei born artist and researcher. In her practice, she explores slow rituals and quantifying and of quantifying and archiving. Data is her working material. She sculpts and transforms it into visualizations, raising, raising sculptures, domestic installations, and printed material. She finds something meditative about a lengthy and repetitive gathering process, which often leads her toward mysteries and uncertainties rather than the simple bare facts we often assign, assign to data. She's a Y6 member at New Museum's New Inc. in collaboration with Rhizome. Her work has appeared in Leonardo and ACM SIGGRAPH and was supported by communities such as NYU Tisch's Interactive Telecommunications Program, the Brown Institute for Media Innovation at Columbia Journalism School, ACCAD at Ohio State University, and EdLab at Teachers College, Columbia University. In fall 2020, she participated in the Science Technology Society Residency Program at Delfina Foundation in the UK. Rosalie is currently teaching at NYU, teaches collaborative arts and ITP. Dear Res Rosalie, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and being here with us today. The screen is yours. Hi, thank you, John and Marco. Um, I'm talking to you all from New York, where I currently live and work. Um, I will go ahead and share my screen. I, um, here, if Marco and John, you can share the link with everyone. And I will share my screen now.
So I prepare a board um, for everyone to, <clears throat> you can consider this as a map of all the things I collected about coin operated rights, which is the project I want to talk, talk to you about today. <clears throat> um, so my current fascination, uh, which is coin operated rights, I study them as a way to understand memory, family history, class, and post-colonial artifacts. Um, my grandfather in Taiwan actually picked up this very labor-intensive work of repairing, painting, and repainting, transporting these machines, and collect the coins for a living. So for those of you who don't know, um, Kitty Ride is um, one of those rides that you see on the street, maybe in front of pharmacy, or in front of a, a, a grocery store that you put in a coin and started going back and forth. Um, and I, I like to say that it's kind of like Mary go around, but Mary doesn't go around just going back and forth. And, and it started singing, uh, singing music. And uh, yeah, so you probably see them around, uh, but they're also slowly disappearing. And the machines that he kept alive also outlive him. So looking at these rides, looking at these machines, I, I tend to ask if there's something more going on with these rides. Maybe it's the creepy makeup by amateur craftsmen like my grandfather that makes them look absurd and somehow cursed. And curse is something that's very hard to pinpoint. It doesn't fit neatly into one category. Its cue is monstrous, it's grotesque. So I'm trying to unpack this feeling of an object that's being physically and spiritually cursed. So what you're seeing here, like a Google search of the rides, the Pikachu rides that you can see mostly in Asia, a lot of them from Taiwan, um, you know, they kind of look like adults. Some of them look like cats and look like a rat, like what's going on? Um, <clears throat> so I've been collecting a lot of information about these machines, including really reading old trade journals and patents. Um, like for example, this is from Billboard from uh, 1953. You have all these um, machines and advertisements. It says this coin operated kitty rides are big plus profit business. You want them in front of your business and they can earn you a lot of money and attract a lot of kids. Um, I also look into patents that was filed. The first ever patent file about kitty ride was in the thirties by this guy called James Otto Hems. Um, and like a lot of early technologies, uh, it was also used for military. Um, around the same time, um, this kind of machine called a link trainer was used for training pilots. So I was also trying to find digital traces of, um, of change that's invisible. So I, um, <laughs> yeah, try not to move the board. <laughs> um, so I, at first I went to Google Street View to try to see if I can find rides that was um, put out by my grandfather, um, but it was already, it was already too, um, when Google Street View started to um, um, record um, the streets, um, my grandfather already, it was already, he was already too sick to work. So I couldn't find any rides I was on the street, but I was able to find some rides that's um, around my, um, around my neighborhood, the, the place I was staying at around the time. For example, this pharmacy. So for those of you who don't know, Google Street View allow you to go back to the past. So um, let's see over here. If we go back to 2011, you see that there is actually a little motorcycle there. And then to 2013, another motorcycle. And now it's a kangaroo. 
and now it's an orange horse. 2019, another orange horse that became a pink pony. Pink pony. And it became a yellow horse. So I was able to see the transition in front of this drugstore. Um, and I think it's kind of interesting because Google map kind of blur out whenever they think they see a face. So they're kind of like ghosts that exist in our daily life, morphing in and out. Um, it feels very haunted. And people also started to um, send me photos of of the kitty ride that I saw whenever they see on the street, like, Rosalie, there's one, go catch them all. And I was like, okay. Um, and I also, I so I try to record them. I try to um, take photographs. I also even trying to um, scan some of them. So these are some of the scans that I did. Just trying to document them. So as I was looking at them, I saw some identical stickers that's on the side of this rides. And so I I look into it and then I call the number and I was able to track down uh, a repair shop in Guanas in Brooklyn. So it was it was owned by it was owned by the guy. He had been in business since the 80s. Uh, he managed most of the rides in five boroughs in New York. Um, so it's actually, it's a lot of rides that he was managing. He's a fascinating guy. And I went down to meet him in the, in a storage or in his storage. And here's like a little interview I have with him. Take that same Pac-Man game. And it after when it first came out, it had a new refreshing, you know, excitement to it. 10 years later, it's a dull, boring Pac-Man game, okay? Not interested. So, a horse is a horse is a horse, which means, as I say, is that the beauty of it is that it doesn't go out of style. Yes, it needs maintenance. I'm not confusing that, and it needs touch-up, but mm -hmm. since kids will be born every year, they will experience this new thing. A lot of kids remember this. It's, I guess it's subliminally, subliminally imprints on their brain yeah, so he's basically saying, you know, Pac-Man go out of fashion, but all the kids want all the decades will always want to ride a horse. And that's why, you know, that's why there's always rides. Um, and even if it's from the from a long time ago, it's still there. And when I was in his workshop, um, I was very haunted by how much it resembled my childhood laundry room because that's where my grandfather set up all the rides and like his workshop. And it just like piles of faded machines waiting for a second life and the familiar smell of the paint, like very toxic. And they're just like lying on the ground usually. And that's most likely poison my three family dogs. So I met him in his small storage and it's hard to imagine that he used to have several workshops upstate um, because of pandemic a lot of local stores closed down and this machine usually are placed in front of local stores not in front of like uh, Starbucks or McDonald's they are in front of like shoe stores or um, you know like pharmacies and so I also realized that you know just a few blocks away there is a shoe store here and I remember before the pandemic, there were a horse there, which you can see over here. And they were there for a long time and they just disappear after the pandemic. <clears throat> so a lot of the, the disappearance of the of the of the rides or what impacted the business is usually, you know, the economic situation or the laws, such as um, the uh, the owners are not allowed to put their merchandise on the street. So um, it's like limited of where they can put out the rides. And I also conducted oral interviews 
with my family. <clears throat> and my family, I think they're not used to people asking them about their past. And it was a very interesting process. I'm going to play a, a conversation with them.马子真多耶朋友游戏也有关系小甜甜小甜甜有一个女孩叫甜甜从小生长在孤儿园对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对
me and my friend David from Smooth Technology, we we kind of look underneath the machine that's not working and then try to recreate the, the mechanism of the, the motor. We made we recreate the motion. We even connect that with a coin receptor that triggers music and moves of this oral documentary that I made. One of the mu music are uh, from the the Kitty Ryman singing, and then my friend. <laughs> 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 so I, I I think I often heard people say, yeah, I remember memories of riding those horses, great memories. And but I think for me, these rides are not really device for imagination. They kind of take me to memories of my grandfather trying to unjamming the the coin acceptors because people just like keep on putting weird random stuff in there and or try to open the coin coin receptor and then steal the coins and also just like my laundry room and home plastic zoo just full of machines and I'm just like memories of me sitting behind him with a plastic uh like a plastic um elephant strapped behind me while he ride his like senyong motorcycle <clears throat> and so there's like a lot of memory came out from interviewing my family and try to recreate these machines and from from interview with my family, I also learned that my grandpa kept a lock a lock book to help keep him track of the locations and earnings of each ride. So I I recreated my own version because there's no way of seeing them like a fictional version. And I also asked the same question to the kitty ride owner, like, do people think there's something strange going on with the ride? We've had many times people call us up, customers say, change this ride, the kids don't like it, they're very scared of it. I say, what? What do you mean they're scared of it? So yeah, I know what it, I know what it is, it's creepy. We don't have creepy rides. I mean, <laughs> some of them are, might be a little bit creepy. But yeah. again, creepy is in the eyes of the beholder. But for kids, you know, you can't understand really what they're thinking. But, but when the owner calls us up and says, that ride's scary. A lot of these machines stay in a location in front of a store for, for, for quite a period of time. Um, for various reasons we keep them there. A lot of kids get attached to the ride. And we've had over the years frantic mothers calling up, oh, what did you do with that Mickey Mouse? Or what did you do with that, that horse? My, my Timothy is, is crying. There, there seems to be a, a, a duck hair. Where's the Mickey Mouse? Attention parents, please do not leave your child unattended while riding the ride. Enjoy the ride, kids. <laughs> the last bit was me trying to recreate that, uh, inspired by cursed images, which I'll talk about in a bit. <clears throat> and from research, I realized um, Actually, I'm not the only person who feel like there is something off about this, right? I even find, it was even reported by a major news outlet in Taiwan that a ride was activated at night by itself. <coughs> this is saying that it was activated by itself and the person who 
uh, the university student who uh, reported got sick for a week afterwards. And they even uh, interview um, Bon Frey Master to see you know, what happened to the ride and there's ways that you can you know, like, help the, the ghost go to a better place. It's kind of insane. And I was very curious, so I actually went online to try to find this ride to see if it's still there. Um, and it was in this night market. Um, so Taiwan has a lot of this night market that in the morning it doesn't look like there's anything there. Um, and I think where was it? it's over here. So this is what the, the market looked like in the morning. See if I can find it. Uh, it's going in circle right now. I think it's here. Oh yeah, it's over here. <laughs> the, the little weird looking horse with the with a coin receptor on, on their neck. I don't think that's a good idea. Um, as I was working out with this, my friend actually say, Rosalie, you need to be careful to work with cursed content. And she even gave me a necklace to, to, to just like try to protect me, try to wear it. Um, so, <clears throat> wait a second, let me go back. Hmm. So to explore further, you know, what curse could mean, feel, or look like, I even collaborated with my friend Stephen Kwok, who has been organizing Zoom performances where he invite people to participate in observe activities to resist the codification of online behavior. So I worked with him to run a recreational horror meeting plus walking tour. And here you can see, I, I wrote the script and you can hear me talking to people <laughs> look around and try to find numbers find numbers and read them to us backwards where am i right now one one nine eight, eight. one two two <laughs> nine. five nine four <laughs> one three my dumb two, two, one, six, nine. one nine eight eighteen thirty two nine nine zero 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 one so i also like now um, find a face object. and slowly zooming into the face oh i got a good one <laughs> <laughs> so what's interesting oh. for zoom is um uh, the the characteristic of zoom is like it cuts to look on how whenever someone's making a voice noise so it's almost like an automatically mm. um Ooh, automatic good, editing man. machine and so in the end we have this film that um, we can watch together. Walk towards a mysterious time. corner. So this was- And stay there for 20 oh. seconds. Like artist in residence when I was doing a residency oh. in the mysterious corner. Uh. So this board is available for, for everyone to see if you want to explore things in here. And I, I think ghost stories are fantastic vehicles to explore feelings of grief and regret for people who who's invisible or usually at the margin. And when I was doing a residency at Drew University working on this project, I was talking to a professor called Wendy Comer, who edited this uh, Haunted the House of Fiction, Haunting the House of Fiction. Um, and she was talking about how haunted fictions are a way for um, or for example, women to express their social and gender position that's forced upon them. So one example would be stories of haunted house and historically women's role as unpaid domestic workers. So I'm thinking about how haunted fiction relates to the invisible labor 
or people like my grandfather, or how it relates to Taiwan's haunted identity. It's illegible, not in focus, blur out, and still haunted by its colonial past. So I was trying to play with the many forms of nostalgia and uncover the root of haunted aesthetic of the rites. My friend Cassie Tarakanjan, a curse scholar, got me into the rabbit hole of the idea of curse and the internet phenomena of curse aesthetic. Um, so for, for those of you who don't know, um, so curse images started with a Twitter account of people just like uploading image that looks very absurd. Um, and it's usually, curse image usually refer to pictures that's perceived as mysterious or disturbing due to its content, poor quality, or a combination of the two. And here is another example. Um, right, like on the right, lower right hand corner, you see that the dates that it, it, it make us think this is probably like a point and shoot camera and the flash, the, the flashlight also, you know, it's like a, it make us um, uh, think of something like a low, like a early, uh, maybe 90s, like uh, not digital camera, but the content itself, it's, it's staged, it's a, um, it, it's not, it, it's probably not real, but because that mismatch between the technology and the content, it creates something, curse, it creates this uneasiness. Um, and some other example are Furby, Furby are very cursed. If you type, if you search a long Furby, you will see even more <laughs> curse images. Um, others are you know, like abandoned playground, like the idea of like liminal space, um, things, places that's supposed to be occupied by human, but no one is there. And another curse aesthetic is like, like uncanny excited is cute, uh, cuteness, also give us this mysterious and uneasy feeling. Um, it plays and swim between boundaries. Um, it swims between boundaries. And what is interesting with cuteness is it explores, exploits um, uncertainty in a very charming way, even when the uncertainty become dangerous, become menacing. And this is like from the conversation between me and an artist, uh, Sydney Schuyler, who's talking about, you know, all the SpongeBob uh, popsicles that's in the mouth of kids, and then it just looked like they're crying. <laughs> so I just, I just filmed them slowly melting down. Those eyes are actually gumballs. I actually didn't know about that. I don't know if you, anyone ate, ate this before. It took me a while to try to find them. And this feeling of unease, um, it made me start looking into machine learning. Um, because machine learning is very good at generating this uncanny feelings and aesthetics, something that's strangely familiar. I started with a platform that used a machine learning model called StyleGam that allows you to generate and modify images of faces, landscapes and paintings, among other pet categories. Using machine learning, I, um, I also generated a virtual rides and document them back on the street of Brooklyn where they're slowly disappearing. Um, so this is a combination of uh, uh, machine learning uh, generated rights and um, rights I can find on um, the street of Brooklyn. And that made me think about the conversation with the Kiriwa owner um, that I interviewed earlier. Let's play this clip. Amusement business and amusement. Yeah. 
most of the people who were involved in the amusement business, and amusement being that we give them a source of entertainment, um, versus vending, which is vending is usually something when you give out a product. So there could be a snack, candy, mm. soda, gumball. When you're giving out something that's not usually a service, what I mean by service is mean like if you if you go on a ride, you don't walk away with anything except the pleasure of having the ride. If you play a video game, you're not getting any way away with anything except the pleasure of playing the game. There's no um, physical thing that you're going to get for your money. Mm -hmm. Do you know about the metaverse? I want to learn a little bit more about it. Yeah. Yes, I also know about NFT, I know about cryptocurrency. Uh, so he basically tried to sell his company to me and get into the metaverse and crypto. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's a fascinating guy because he, he has been in the entertainment business since the 80s from like tabletop games and those machines that we see in the uh, in the bars and kitty rise and now now crypto metaphors um and from conversation with my friend sarah rothberg we became curious about you know the parallel between entertainment vending machine market and how nfts and metaverse manipulate the concept of ownership um, vending machine do not sell any any physical products but a piece of entertainment and versus nft is something that you do not physically own but it's like the idea of owning it and then we were joking that I can try to help him reopen his shop in Minneapolis and <laughs> just like renting his rights out. <clears throat> so this fascination of kitty rides um, leads me to explore the historical formations of nostalgia, the aesthetics of marginal feelings, the, ma the materiality of memory and how this intersect with global capitalism and colonialism. So although my grandfather has already passed, I'm trying to link in my ritual of data gathering with his ritual of maintenance. It's like my effort to try to fill the gap, but also stay with the mystery of this labor, um, of this, of his labor, of this obsolete machines and post-colonial artifacts, which are at the intersection between fantasy and nightmare, between trash we ignore and artifacts we value. So it's like really a journey down the rabbit hole of this nostalgic objects and in accessible memories. And I just remember I went to a screening of a movie, The Internal Daughter. I feel like a lot of people probably, uh, 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 people in the audience probably see, uh, saw it before. It's a it's the same director as the souvenir, Joanna Hawk. Um, and there's a memoir, the movie, The Internal Daughter is a memoir about the director's mother played by Tilda Swinton. Um, I, and I love that Tilda say in the interview that memory is kind of like weather, it changes, it comes and goes. And the director said, she's trying to make a memoir without memory. And I thought that was beautiful. And, <clears throat> And I thought that when memories become the data that I collect, I'm confronting with like the slipperiness of the material, how it, the forms morphs and temperature fluctuate and how it seemed to escape from my hands. And I was also thinking about how memory passed down and what kind of memory got passed down. And I feel like stories of women in my family were often obscure or made illegible and then men's story are often glorified, such as stories of my grandfather or my father. Um, so I'm very curious to see if I can continue manipulate digital image making tools to give form to, to ghosts and to somehow reveal the hidden power structure. Um, yeah, that was, that was the end of my talk. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Um, I wonder, I'm not really looking at the chat, but if there's any questions or I can just um, um, keep on, um, continue with the activity.
Well, thank you so much in the meantime from our side. <clears throat> I think that maybe um, we can give the audience a little bit more time to um, write their questions in the chat and maybe we can have a little conversation among ourselves first. Um, yeah, maybe I, I wanted to ask you something a little bit maybe about your, your process and I know you wanted to also add something of us. Uh, so I don't know if this is a good moment to, to start that or if you want to do it later. Yeah, I, I'm i very curious to ask everyone because whenever I talk about this project with my friends, they're like, oh, yeah, I remember this ride that I walked by or like this thing that still haunted me from my childhood. So I want to ask people in the audience today, do you remember strange sculptures or kitty rides from your own childhood? Um, weird, weird sculptures exit in the the playground or in front of your grocery stores. Um, doesn't have to be kitty rides. Uh, when you're waiting for your parents to shop or um and when you when you look at them as an adult you're like well they're actually very strange like <laughs> I didn't notice that when I was a kid um and I was I was trying to see if you guys can try to search for them online to search on some kind of information or or street view and if you don't remember one you can maybe drop a pin and take a walk around your local grocery store and try to see if you can find one. Um, and if and you don't find one, you can even go back in time before the pandemic. They're kind of like Easter egg, they might, might come out. Right, and so they're, they're like, uh, John just posted the link again on the chat. Uh, so we'll do that by dragging an image in the mirror board, right? Yeah, so, so yeah, I, I should give a little bit so the mirror board is like really a collaboration board. So you can um, type something here. You can drag and drop an image inside. Um, you can even embed something here. You see many fishes floating around. So I just, uh, just added uh, a screenshot of uh one of the kitty rides that i can remember from my childhood uh this is uh, yours uh, yeah the one in in on the Rivia, in the the town where where i grew up uh, the one that you can see there is a horse but um there was different uh ride before it, well it was not a ride in fact it was a it was a monkey uh that still today feels very strange and daunting and cursed <laughs> uh, because <laughs> it was basically a monkey that would say, uh, I'm a shameless monkey. <laughs> I want to be your friend. I want to be like you. And uh, I, to be honest, I didn't remember about it until like we started talking uh, about this, this uh, skin work. And I I searched for it and I found that the same monkey uh, that I'm adding now here to the board was placed also in different cities in Spain. And there's quite a lot of people uh, talking about it because the, like the audio was really, really creepy. Like I'm I'm a shameless monkey. Uh, I want to be your friend. I want <laughs> to be like you. Sounds like he was really cursed, not only in the internet. <laughs> he was, and also like, like uh, yeah, Rosalie's story has brought me all these like uh, creepy stories. Uh, well, not creepy stories, but this uh, this feeling from from that time. And uh, yeah, I guess that already when I was like a child, I would feel like this creepiness, and it's still there. So the yeah, also the monkey was in a like caged. Which that's, uh, that's fantastic. That screen works, uh, you know, also works for therapy for us, bringing up <laughs> all of these things. But in the meantime, maybe while people are looking for uh, images or things that they can contribute or links, um, I just wanted to maybe bring one one uh, question from the chat. If you have a, uh, maybe a moment to reply. So William Simpson asks, um, do you ever use AI generated photos and how do they create that disturbing effect? So maybe, yeah, you could tell us maybe a little bit more about the process and how you use, uh, you, you mentioned style gun, but maybe you can go a bit more into, um, yeah, the, the kind of making of, of these images. Yeah, I, I think with this project, I choose to use um, uh, machine learning or AI generated photos because <clears throat> Machine learning is very good at generating images that look strangely familiar. Um, 
something that you look like maybe this person exists, but maybe there is something off about the person, like the tease is weird, the ear is kind of weird, or uh, you're trying to um, create a picture of the dog, but you know that the, the eyes is kind of um, it is not at the right place. Or I think that that was the reason why when I when I delve into the idea of a curse and I uh, I choose to um, look into machine learning, the ways of generating images using machine learning, and see if I can. Um, recreate or try to capture that in-between feeling that it's very hard to um, to describe with words, yeah. I think that's particularly I, interesting also, this thing that you mentioned about this, uh, oh, there's a wonderful... Yeah, someone generated with, uh, <laughs> with, with machine learning. Yeah, maybe the person who has generated and added yeah, this who, generated who, uh, wanna say something? Yeah, I would wanna, love like... to hear what you, what you wrote. And... And how do you generate this? This is by yeah, not able to see the name, but yeah, feel free also to to let us know on the chat uh, whoever has created this image with a, a generative model to let us know a little bit <laughs> about it. But yeah, no, maybe just uh, while while um, um, the the author <laughs> decides to to share something more, I just wanted to. Uh, also say something about this idea of the curse image is particularly interesting to me because there's something that is also about seduction right like you are really intrigued by these images and at the same time it's really something that disturbs you and I think also in your work it connects so much you you mentioned you know this um, um, nightmare and fantasy right you have like this childhood and then you have also all of these like other uh, dimensions also of labor and uh, colonialism so I, I just wonder, like, if how, how do you see this kind of specific form of image? You know, like the, the cursed image, I think it seems to me that it reveals and it contains something much more than just a simple um, internet meme wars the moment. Oh, in the meantime, Janice. Yeah, so if I rephrase it, question you are saying how I see the curse image in um, different from the internet phenomenon or right I mean because it kind of like you know um, the, the curse image is this idea of you know just something that stays with us uh, but I think it, it does contain all of this different dimension that seem very paradoxical and in your work they really kind of explode and come to, to this aesthetic really you know create something powerful as a form of image that can can help us maybe i don't know if i guess the question is like can the curse image become more than just you know um a form of online um attention economy driven or not even an attention economy driven but is is it something more on the level of of um, um image politics i guess yeah, I think from from my perspective, working with this project, um, like seeing seeing all the rights from Taiwan, especially from Taiwan, they're borrowing um, images from like very dominant culture. Um, like I use example like Mickey Mouse and and uh, Pikachu and. Um, and people like my grandfather needs to paint them. And I kind of associate the creepiness with, for, for me, because I'm Taiwanese, I, I, I see that a lot in, in a lot of post-colonial countries that um, um, there's like that bootleg culture that you see things that kind of looks like a lot of, um, something that you see on TV, but you know that um, it's it's probably fake or, um, you know, someone else recreated. And, and I think to, uh, to try to capture that curse aesthetic for me is to try to capture or try to say, you know, the, like I described earlier, how, you know, Taiwan as a country is constantly borrowing other icons and um, metaphors or 
things from other countries just because we don't really have a very strong identity and um and like identity itself is hunted so I think for me I'm trying to borrow um you know the idea of curse or like curse images to kind of speak to this aspect yeah thanks yeah so it's a form of also political reappropriation in a way right very mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> also another question from the chat from uh, Rachel uh, asking is uh, if is there a motivation to reclaim certain steady categories that have also been assimilated by other contexts or nation states? Is there a motivation to reclaim certain aesthetic category that has been assimilated by other contexts, nation states? Kind of the same. Um, I'm trying to understand the question a little bit better. Can, um, as you were just saying now, oh, <laughs> I guess that was a sort of similar question. Yeah, the the reason why I pick those two very dominant uh, imagery is because, you know, they they are powerful neighbors, and it's uh, and like I said, like Taiwan is such an interesting country that's colonized by both in the East and the West. And um, and there, those images are kind of like Trojan horse entering Taiwan. And that's why I I choose chose those use those images to create my piece. Yeah. And looking also at your previous projects, uh, I guess that there's some sort of like an interest on the on some materiality of the image or trying to to create like or to reflect on uh, physical representations of, of certain images. I mean, you've worked also with photogrammetry and this like photogrammetry uh, hack. So mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this sort of like emotion linked to the to somehow bring into the physical world the images is something that you would say that is present in, in, in many of your works because I can see some of that also on the AR uh, representations of these kitty rice, trying to bring them back, not these this, this machines that somehow are disappearing. Um, sorry, I just trying to navigate a little bit. <laughs> um, so your question was, um, I'm like from my past work, I was trying to kind of uh, capture those feelings and mm -hmm. and with this it's kind of similar to this project. I'm trying to capture those like creep like a like a uh, like a curse feeling I got from this right. Yeah, maybe in the previous ones were not so creepy at all. Uh, but in these ones are like creepiness has has changed. Yeah. But it's more about the emotions, like trying to represent the emotions in like uh, through these uh, images. Yeah, I, I think I that was, thank you for the question. I think I was very interested in capture um, things that's in between. And mm -hmm. there is this there is this uh, term called the unfeeling, which is basically your feelings are too small or from the Western perspective that it doesn't count as a feeling because they are too subtle. And I was very interested in the idea of platonic intimacy. Um, and so in my past project, I was trying to see if I can use the tool such as photogrammetry and work with a, a, a group of people and recreating a certain situation that made me feel ambivalent or uncomfortable and then have people experience that. And I think tools such as emerging uh, photo tools such as photogrammetry is a kind of 3D scanning, but because it's using photos, uh, it's um, I can have one person take a photo and and I have 40 people and I have 40 photos and I can um, try to recreate those models. And um, and I and in the meantime, I have um, two strangers trying to trying to learn how to embrace each other. And a lot of times um, a lot of mistake happen or the hugs let go. So <clears throat> I was oh. I was hoping to kind of capture whatever happened during the process, like what kind, what the human error, and in trying to um, translate that into like a three dimensional sculpture object. So, yeah, like I guess to your question, that was also trying to think about 
trying to capture the feelings that's very hard to express or um, usually illegible. And, and I think um, photogrammetry as a medium is also kind of interesting because it's a medium between photography and sculpture, right? Like you, you, it's like a transitional medium. And in a way that's also, you know, something in between, yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, you were replying, I, I saw that uh, there's still people uh, adding some screenshots to to the board. So hopefully by <clears throat> when we finish this, you will have like <laughs> a nice collection of, of screenshots of, of different machines. Uh, from Should I share my screen? Should I share my screen again if people want to share something? Please, sure, we can try. Yeah, in fact, I can see that it's... Is this uh, from Lauren? Yeah, if Lauren wants to maybe uh, explain a little bit about it, I'm... Yeah, feel free to unmute yourself. Yeah, hold on. We can try to change that. One second. The shameless giraffe. <laughs> oh, hi, yeah. Hi. Uh, hi. I wanted to add these giraffes in. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I remember these from my childhood um, on a road near where my nan lived. And I, it made me think I didn't even realize that it disappeared because I grew up. Mm. So I just stopped thinking about its existence, but I've just walked back through the history and found what year was it there until these, the first one, it goes back to 2008. Mm. You can see the position where it changes. So the first one is it's on the left of the shop and then it moves to the right. These three other pictures. And then in 2020, it disappears. In 2020. Yeah, so like what you said, yeah. Yeah. And I like the, I've zoomed in on his face for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's blurred out. Uh, yeah, I wonder if the, the, the store is still open. Maybe it's also closed down. Uh, the store is something different now. Yeah, it has changed yeah. from what it was for a long time. Mm. But yeah, yeah, I think of this machine very fondly as a big part of my childhood. <laughs> That's so sweet. It's really nice to see it again, actually. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes people will tell me, oh, like I, I thought something disappeared or they de demolished a playground and they were able to find uh they were able to find it from Google Street View. It's kind of like a like I said, like an Easter egg or just there there's some information that you can try to get into, get under. Um yeah, lovely. Thank you so much for your talk. It was really enjoyable. Thank you. Really enjoyable. Thank you. And on the note, I think that um, we're going to leave the, the link here and also for anybody, um, you know, looking on YouTube at the video recording in the future. I don't know if you'll leave the mirror board up, um, but, you know, if you find it online, feel free to contribute with more uh, images and, um, yeah, locations or things that could uh, contribute to um, the this collection. Um, I'm going to... Um, Thank you, Rosalie, and thank everyone for joining us today. It's been a wonderful talk and a uh, really fantastic project that touches so many different dimensions from a private to political spheres, and it really um, managed to leave us very much disturbed <laughs> and touched at the same time. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, thank you from my side too. Uh, thank you so much, Rosalie. It's been a pleasure. It was been really nice and really interesting. A uh, little bit creepy, but uh, like uh, creepy enough, I would say. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for everyone who has joined. Um, we will be back in two weeks. Uh, the next skin work is with uh, Joan von Guberta. So we invite you all to 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 come. And. Uh, uh, See you we... in two weeks uh, with the fury of images. 